What do you want for Christmas, Claire? Well, I don't know if you're like me, but nothing says Christmas like drug deals gone awry, underground raves, car chases through the streets of Las Vegas, and a telepathic and possibly homicidal cat. Oh yes, it's a Christmas movie like no other as we discuss Doug Lyman's Go in this month's Best Movie You Never Saw. My friend Claire here says it's gonna be a kick-ass fucking time. My best mates are going to Las Vegas this weekend. I'm told it's incredible. If you take my shift, I can go with them. Everybody wins. So this one stars Katie Holmes, Sarah Polly, a young Timothy Oliphant, Scott Wolf, Jay Moore, Tay Diggs, and William Fickner. This one takes place over an eventful Christmas Eve as a disparate group of 20-somethings deal with drug deals gone wrong, touchy-feely cops, bad drug trips, angry gangsters, dead-end minimum wage jobs, and a whole lot of angst. You know what I like best about Christmas? The surprises. I mean, it's like you get this box, and you're sure you know what's inside of it. No doubt in your mind. But then you open it up, and it's completely different. So, in the late 90s, youth movies, as well as the burgeoning indie scene, were starting to come together, and labels like Miramax were putting out teen fare like She's All That, and big studios were starting to get into the game, as these movies you know, typically had pretty low budgets, but could have kind of high grosses. So Paramount Pictures launched a label called MTV Films, which funny enough has now become very prestigious and is the company behind Yellowstone, which is about as far from the origins as you'd expect, and a lot of other studios followed suit. So Sony Pictures decided to pony up some serious money to make teen picks like Can't Hardly Wait and Idle Hands. Enter director Doug Lyman and screenwriter John August, who somehow also managed to push this dark slice of life indie comedy through that mainstream studio process, with the studio probably hoping that they would get a good teen movie. And they did kind of, because a lot of hip of the moment actors like Katie Holmes and Scott Wolf were in the cast, which made the film seem like a teen film, even though it wasn't. The result, sadly, though, was a mere $16 million gross, although this can obviously be explained by the fact that Go opened just two weeks after The Matrix. If teen audiences were going to flock to see one movie, well, that was going to be the one, right? Luckily, when it hit VHS cable and the then nascent DVD format, Go took on something of a cult following, and among those who have actually seen it, it's a fondly remembered film. So Go is an interesting outlier in director Doug Lyman's career. He shot it after Swingers, and you can see it's him trying to bridge the hip indie world with more commercial vibe. And the movie is chock full of the indie aesthetic, making it one of the least studio flavored movies of the era. I'm not saying it's anything it's not. It's just, come on, this time yesterday, who would have thunk it? Other than the pricey soundtrack, which featured Len's massive hit Steal My Sunshine and the uniformly attractive cast of hip 90s actors, you'd never figure this was a mainstream studio movie with a $20 million budget, which I have to say goes a lot further now than it did then. A movie like Go would never be financed for 20 million bucks now. It would be made for a fraction of that. But $20 million in 1999 didn't go all that far because remember, they were shooting on film and, you know, they couldn't do things quickly on the go, one might say. You know, wow, bang, surprise. I mean, it's, it's kind of like you and me here, you know? Now, I remember seeing trailers for this back in 1999 and assuming it would just be another teen flick, mostly due to the fact that it starred Katie Holmes, who was then riding high on Dawson's Creek. She was being pitched like the star of this movie, and I have to say I was burned by her previous film, Disturbing Behavior, which I remember really not liking at the time because, you know, it was recut by the studio and it came out running about 80 minutes. And back then, you know, when you were buying movie tickets as a teenager, they weren't, you know, cheap, so... I remember being kind of feeling ripped off when I saw that movie, that it was barely even a film. So I kind of had like a sore spot against Katie Holmes at the time, which is kind of strange looking back. If the movie did have a real lead in the ensemble, it was probably Sarah Polly, who was kind of a big deal in Canada at the time because she was the star of a TV series called Road to Avonlea. And this was her trying to break out into US films. I never considered going to see this movie in theaters, even though I probably should have if, you know, as a 16 year old, I was willing to go see MGM's awful indie flavored reboot of the Mod Squad, which came out a week before this movie. I should have been willing to go see Go as well, but 
alas. I finally caught up with the film on cable about a year later, and I remember being totally blown away by the film's combustible energy and manic pace. From the first frame to the last, Lyman's film is utterly propulsive. No easy feat considering the fact that the focus is split between four interconnected stories. Sure, it's kind of a ripoff of Pulp Fiction, but I maintain there's not a weak link amongst the stories, with only Katie Holmes' infatuation with Timothy Oliphant's dreamy drug dealer coming close to the teen fantasy the movie was marketed as. But even this comes to kind of an unexpected resolution. Oh, he's the good drug dealer, right. Sometimes I get confused. The cast, while filled with a lot of actors whose careers kind of petered out towards the end of the decade, is uniformly excellent. Sarah Polly anchors the film as the rebellious supermarket cashier who ill-advisedly tries to sell a little ecstasy to make rent. This should have made her a star, but it sounded like that wasn't something that Sarah Polly ever really wanted, with her telling Now Magazine, I really, really didn't want to be in the public eye. I really didn't want to have any kind of fame. I was really stressed out about the idea of being in a movie that was being pushed to be out there. At that age, that was my real phobia. So Go did put her front and center on the poster, but Sarah Polly seemed like she wasn't that interested in really becoming a leading lady. And sure enough, she's become an excellent director with her recent Women Talking playing to great reviews at TIFF and seeming like a front runner for some Oscars. Tons of actors that would become pretty big later on turn up in this, including Tay Diggs, and in a tiny role, a young Melissa McCarthy, while the soundtrack is a terrific 1999 time capsule. Now, anyone who's seen Go, if they were to pick out their favorite moment, I'd wager a good 90% of them would just reply, Drug Cat. This is a great throwaway gag while Nathan Bexton's Manny while tripping balls starts to hallucinate that Timothy Oliphant's cat can read his thoughts and most disturbingly make dire predictions about his future. It's kind of fun. Now of the four stories, if I was to rank them in the order of preference, I would say probably my favorite are the Boys in Las Vegas story, which you know, it's the one that everybody kind of doesn't like, but I always enjoyed Tay Diggs and his gang running afoul of gangsters in Vegas, and I love the car chase with the remix of Magic Carpet Ride. I always thought that was really cool. Whatever. 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 What you mean, whatever? The other story that's pretty cool is Sarah Polly selling the E at the rave, which kind of ties into a separate story on its own, Katie Holmes and Tim Oliphant, which to me is kind of the weakest of the film. I never really got Timothy Oliphant's redemption because at one point he just kind of leaves Sarah Polly's character for dead. I don't think he's actually that nice of a guy, frankly. Another good story in this, but kind of the one that sticks out a little bit is Jay Moore and Scott Wolf as these two gay actors who get you know, taken in by this kind of touchy-feely cop played by William Fickner. You work out, don't you? You have to. It's in the contract. No, no, you got a great body. It's interesting, but it also plays to a lot of stereotypes from the late 90s and kind of ages the film a little bit more. But even that's not necessarily a bad thing, though, because there's no movie that's more 1999 than Go, right? Anyway, it's a very unusual Christmas movie, and it's pretty easy to find. You can find it on streaming, it's also out on Blu-ray and DVD, and a pretty stacked edition. You can find it on Sony's Crackle sometimes, so anywhere you want to find this movie, you probably can see it for free right now if you want. Now, while there's no doubt that Go is a total 90s nostalgia piece at this point, to me it belongs up there with the best indie flicks of the era. It's the equal of almost anything produced at the mini indie giants like Miramax and New Line, and it's a movie I'm really fond of returning to every couple of years, so check it out.